Welcome to the BMJ Podcast. I'm Cameron Abbas, the Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ. In this week's podcast, we'll hear why experts think that all of the talk of changing how we pay for health is pointless. There's no real public appetite for changing that. And one of the authors of our blockbuster ultra-processed foods umbrella review has thoughts about the global food system. It would really almost involve just (laughs) blowing the whole thing up and starting again. But first, in the UK, healthcare workers, first nurses, then junior doctors, then consultants, went on strike about pay and conditions. And for junior doctors, those strikes are ongoing. That comes with worries about patient safety, and there's a mechanism in place to recall healthcare staff if patients are at risk. An investigation by the BMJ's Gareth Ayakabuchi, who is our assistant news editor, has looked at that process and how often it's used. And Gareth joins me now. Hello, Cameron. So, Gareth, um, these are called derogation requests. Can you please explain what they are? Yes, sure. So... When the um, industrial dispute between the government and specifically junior doctors began last year, this was an agreement between the BMA and NHS England. And essentially they agreed to this process for recalling doctors who are on strike um, in the event of safety concerns, but specifically safety concerns that are arising from unexpected and extreme circumstances that, that were actually unrelated to the industrial action. So the measure is not in place to avoid any disruption, but it's there to ensure that in these unexpected circumstances, patients will continue to receive safe care. Okay, so there has to be an agreement between the BMA and the Trust? Yes, or or NHS England, yes, but essentially that's right. Okay, so what are the data that we collected through this Freedom of Information request? What did the data show? So um, we had a pretty good response rate 90 trusts so over two-thirds of of trusts that we contacted and the vast majority said that they didn't make any of these requests to the BMA during any of the first nine periods of strike action by junior doctors a small minority so seven trusts made one or more requests Um, of these the the vast majority I think almost 90 percent were rejected by the BMA a couple were withdrawn and I think one was approved so I guess what our data shows is that in the majority of the cases, this process hasn't been used by trusts. But, but in the cases when it has, the, you know, it's often been rejected, typically been rejected. An inevitable reason uh, to ask for staff to return to work clearly is a question around patient safety. But has any of this investigation shown that patient safety has been compromised? In essence... No. I mean, the data show that in some trusts, medical directors and senior bosses, they, they've they warned of potential harm to patients from things like cancelling operations at the last minute and short staffing on on the these um, documents that were disclosed to us. Um, but um, the data itself doesn't actually show us evidence of harm. And, and one thing that it was difficult for us to get was... Um, you know information on on what happened afterwards what 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 was the actual impact after the events we did approach a few trusts that supplied us with information and um unfortunately we weren't really able to get much from from trusts or the medical directors on on you know their assessment of it after the event really what are the implications of these findings then gareth it seems to me that perhaps the process hasn't quite worked in the way that it needed to I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, um, I think the BMA initially last year reported that the process was working well, but I think more recently relations with NHS England and with trusts have become more fraught and there are, there were clearly disagreements over how and when this process should be used. Um, And um, I guess the broader point is that, you know, that there has been a breakdown in relationship in, in some cases between you know, the BMA and the employer. And I suppose it, given this kind of really prolonged period of action, um, it's clearly taking its toll on everyone, whether that's staff, patients, employers. Um, and I I guess really all sides would welcome a resolution to the dispute, but hmm. clearly where the disagreement is on how and 
how that's achieved and how we get there. Yeah, I, I mean, just I mean, uh, just going back to derogation, what are employers saying now? What is their kind of response to this situation? I I think that they are frustrated, and I think you know, I guess concerns over things like safe staffing are there all the time. They're not just there on strike days. Hmm. And I guess on strike days, that the, these their pressures are exacerbated. And particularly if we're talking about the strike in January, when quite a few of these requests were made, that was in the middle of winter. So you are going to be dealing with seasonal pressures. And I think that employers feel under pressure and they want to ensure that, you know, that services are staffed safely. But I think in reality, that really does go beyond the question of derogations. That's a, that's a wider issue. And that's not just a pressure on strike days. That's a pressure, you know, all the time. Yeah. Really. So we've got, we've got a yeah. chronic situation with staffing levels that predates any industrial action. Um, uh, what is what is the BMA view on how things have played out? Well, I, I mean, on the patient safety side, it said it takes con- any concerns around patient safety very seriously, and it's also, you know, stressing that it's very willing to work with NHS England on you know prioritisation, rescheduling of treatment and care whilst at the same time balancing this with doctors legal right to take industrial action which um, you know obviously they they want to maintain And that article about derogations uh, written by Gareth Akabuchi is now online and the links are in the podcast notes We'll be returning to money later with a look at how the NHS should be funded. But first, our recent umbrella review on ultra processed foods has had an incredible level of attention. And so Duncan Jarvis, our producer and multimedia editor, spoke to one of the authors about their work. And in particular, what the link between ultra processed foods and poorer health outcomes means for society. My name's Felice Jacker and I'm the founder and director of the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin University in Australia. Um, our centre has, uh, well, I suppose we've really led the world in many ways in this, in this area of nutritional psychiatry, which focuses on how what we eat, our habitual diets, interact with our um, mental and brain health. And, and we do this across the life course, early start, the beginning of life right to the end, And we also do clinical trials. We seek to understand the mechanisms by which diet influences mental health. And um, we also have a big focus on, I guess, things that lend themselves to policy discussions around the food environment. Now, you've recently published with us this umbrella study on ultra-processed foods. And since they were kind of categorised back in 2009, there's been an absolute explosion and kind of interest in this and in in publication. So, what what was it that you did? Well, we did what was is called an umbrella review, where you take all the meta analyses that have been published, and you put them together and crunch the numbers. And from that, with this umbrella review, we ended up with data from roughly ten million people, mainly adults, uh, because of all of the studies that sat underneath that. And we looked at a whole raft of health outcomes, including overall mortality. And we found that um, the a higher intake of ultra-processed foods was linked to 70% or so of the health outcomes we looked at, including um, overall mortality, so risk of early death, cardiometabolic disorders, uh, common mental disorders. Now, of course, This is observational literature, but this is part of a wider field of study that seeks to understand how food influences health outcomes. And of course, this finding is in line with a lot of uh, the studies that have looked at this in a bit more depth. They've done mechanistic studies or maybe trials, interventions. You did find the association held across different uh, doses as it were, of ultra-processed food. Do you just sort of talk us through that? Well, I think 
When you see a dose-response relationship between an exposure and a health outcome, it tends to point to the fact that this is a real relationship. The more you have of something, the more likely it is you've got this health outcome. So in general, in epidemiology, we look for dose-response relationships. When it comes to things like ultra-processed food intake, um, I think it's going to vary a lot by population, by individuals, and I don't think we can say for sure yet, oh, you know, this many grams a day of ultra-processed foods is going to cause this health outcome. Not even close. In Australia, though, we did do a study where we, we did see a threshold where people who were consuming ultra-processed food above about 30% of their daily intake, they did seem to have an increased risk of the, the health outcome. Um, but I think, again, we need more knowledge to understand exactly where that cut point might be, and it will vary a lot based on a whole host of factors. Um, but certainly we need a lot more, I think, research to understand those specific things. And, of course, to drill down, we know that some ultra-processed foods are worse than others or, you know, carry more of a health impact than others. Um, the categorisation of ultra-processed foods is still, you know, imprecise and that's not surprising because diet is the most complex exposure that we have really. Um, it's amazingly complex and it's not something that's like a single target like cigarettes, tobacco smoking is. The NOVA categorisation system that is often uh, considered, well, it's often debated, although often I would say that, that those debates and those, um, that those queries are coming from industry behind the scenes. Um, the categorisation system was really developed to inform public policy, not to inform individuals at the checkout as to what food they should be, you know, choosing between that bread and that bread. So I don't think it's particularly great for doing that, uh, but it wasn't designed for that. It's designed to inform health policy. And this is what we hope that this review gets onto the table. We need to be considering this. We shouldn't be blaming individuals for choosing an ultra-processed meal at the checkout. We need to be saying to the, to the uh, policy makers in government, why don't you have effective policies in place that make it easier for people to access healthful foods and to, um, you know, not default to ultra-processed foods, which at the moment are the most heavily marketed, the cheapest, the most ubiquitous, they're everywhere, and the most socially normalised. Um, you know, why can't we be addressing this massive elephant in the room of the food environment? To de and develop effective food policies that support individuals to very easily make better food choices. But I don't have the hugest amount of um, optimism because the players involved are just so big and so powerful and so wealthy and it would really almost involve just <laughs> blowing the whole thing up and starting again. And so I really don't know how things are going to change until people start to really vote with their wallets and that's a really big challenge because people's wallets are very, very thin these days. And that article, Ultra Processed Food Exposure and Adverse Health Outcomes, is available on bmj.com. Links, as ever, are in the podcast notes. Finally, as part of the BMJ's Commission on the Future of the NHS, we asked some experts to think about funding. Alex Maffey, the BMJ's editorial registrar, who's taken a year out of clinical practice to work with us, I hope he's enjoyed himself, has handled that paper. Uh, Alex spoke to two of the authors, but before we listen to that conversation, Alex, what are the key messages from this paper? Yes, I think this paper's come at a very timely uh, moment, really, where British Social Attitudes Survey has just shown that sort of faith in the NHS is at an all-time low. Um, waiting lists are at an all-time high. Um, and half the workforce is striking. So this paper goes into into a few different issues around NHS funding. Firstly, it looks at the funding structures in the UK um, and whether those are still working for us um, and takes us through 
I think a helpful reminder of the arguments why general taxation is you know is a great mechanism for for funding a national health service and why that is something that we should be keeping and protecting um, it then looks at how uh, NHS funding has grown um, over the last 50 odd years since its inception um, and sort of thinking about whether it can keep growing and how we need to sort of project into the future uh, and look at sort of the sustainability of the financing. Um, and then finally, the authors provide some very interesting uh, recommendations as to thinking about future NHS fin financing and the, the process itself of deciding how much money the NHS needs um, and the involvement of both an independent body and patients and the public as well in those decisions. OK, thank you. I mean, I've read, obviously, I've read the paper. I think it's a particularly clear account of the history of funding in the NHS and also the trajectory of funding, which I think is very important. Mm. Uh, and they talk about this notion of exponential growth in funding, uh, but implementing health policies that stop that exponential growth at some future point. Uh, so I would recommend that to anybody listening, that they do read the paper. But in terms of what the authors specifically recommend, what are, the, what are those recommendations, Alex? Um, well, that's what I spoke to John Appleby and Gillian Leng, um, two of the authors of the paper, about. So let's listen to that now. Uh, I'm Gillian Leng. I trained as a doctor many years ago, specialised in public health, worked at NICE for 20 years where I gained a lot of interest and insights in how the NHS is funded and I'm now the President-elect at the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm John Appleby, um, I've now retired, um, I was a Chief Economist at the Nuffield Trust and before that at the King's Fund Health Think Tanks based in London. So we, we were asked by the BMJ to look at three particular questions around how the NHS is funded. The first one was, how do we pay for it? The second was, how much money is needed? And the third was, how do we decide how much? So the NHS is funded predominantly through general taxation, as you say in the paper. Um, but there are other ways of paying for healthcare. care. Um, now, you said, let's stick to that taxation system. Um, can you tell us why? We didn't find any really compelling evidence to uh, embark on a complete overhaul of how we raise the money. How do we take the money out of people's pockets to pay for the NHS? When you actually look in detail at, uh, I don't know, Germany or France or some other countries who have a social health insurance system, it tends to be compulsory. <laughs> and it's very... It's not that different from a tax, essentially. You can't avoid paying it. Our reading of the evidence is that switching from a, a taxation system now to some other system, which would, which would look, let's, let's be honest, very like a German health, a social health insurance system. Um, it, it's uh, almost certainly not worth the upheaval. Um, I mean, the other thing to say about general taxation is that it's, um, it's reasonably progressive. Um, so uh, the poor pay less proportionately than the rich. Um, and in fact, in public surveys, I've been involved in something called the British Social Attitudes Survey for many years, which is a big survey of, um, well, as it says on the tin, Britons um, and their views about various things, including healthcare. Absolutely overwhelming majority every year are, are keen that the NHS is funded via a general taxation system. There's no real public appetite for changing that. And when I say overwhelming, I'm, look, I'm it's, it's sort of 80 or 90 percent of the population across all parties, across all ages and so on. So there's no real public a a appetite for changing. So our view was um, stick with general taxation as a way of funding and uh, move on to maybe address some more uh, pertinent and um, uh, difficult issues about how much we raise and how and how we decide and so on. Great. So following on from that, I might put the next question to Gillian. Um, so critics of paying through ta uh, general taxation say this leaves healthcare funding at the mercy of politics. Now, in the paper, you've offered a potential solution which aligns with uh, Nigel Crisp's um, and, hi and his colleagues' Um, solution in their paper on the founding principles of the NHS. Um, so could you just tell us a bit more about what this solution is? Politicians obviously have a legitimate interest 
in our healthcare system. As John said, it's a taxation funded system and it's all about the health of the population for which they have the fundamental responsibility. So we we are absolutely not saying that politicians should have no role in healthcare. What we are saying is that we want to try and reduce the year on year variability in the amount of funding that goes to health. We want to increase openness of how the funding is decided and we want to increase accountability of the government and all of that will help forward planning and ensure that that uh, there's less of that year-on-year -year variation. So what we've proposed in the paper is a new independent body called the Office for NHS Policy and Budgetary Responsibility. Similar, if you, if you will, to the OBR, the Office of Budgetary Responsibility that people may well be familiar with in relation to finances uh, of, of the country and their role there, which is entirely independent and in providing advice to government. And it would model over five, 10, even potentially 50 years what we were going to need. It would draw input from various uh, respected resources like royal colleges, it would look at demographic change, what the population was going to become in terms of age, ethnicity, etc. And it would look at the new technologies. And as I'm very aware of from, from my years at NICE, there is, if you like, a tsunami of new technologies and effective new medicines that are just waiting to be approved and used. And somebody is going to have to decide how much of that we can afford. So. There would be all of that modelling that would be put in this report, probably every five years, coinciding with the new with with the election of a new government. The key bit is then the response from the government. That bit around accountability, there would need to be from the government a five-year strategic plan based on that forward view. It would need to come with a five-year settlement of funding and a provisional 10-year settlement of funding to help the planning as I described at the at the beginning and an important part of taking the decision around what are we going to provide over the next five to ten years is public input and enabling the public to have a say um, and and there are various ways that that might be achieved. One possibility could be something like a, a citizen's jury, citizen's council, whereby the public could could deliberate on what, what should be funded and what shouldn't. But uh, all of that would, would could be wrapped up in an independent process led by government in terms of an open response that we could then, as citizens, track progress against. I think we we envisage this OPBR as an information provider in a sense. Um, what would what does the future potentially look like? Where where are we potentially going? Where could we go? It's not about, as, as Jill said, it's not about the OPBR making the choices for us, but it's providing the sorts of information that we need to know in order to actually confront difficult economic choices. Um, I mean, I mean, the most fundamental choice is how much do we want to spend on healthcare? It's not how much the NHS needs. Um, it, it's about our choices, actually. And at the moment, you know, it, it's government. We elect governments and they make those decisions, uh, in a sense, on, on our behalf. We know that, for example, in the UK, healthcare spending has on average since its inception in 1948 out, outstripped the growth in GDP uh, on, on average uh, by uh, one over a percent. Now that really accumulates over time. So we're spending a bigger chunk of our national economy on the, on the health service. Uh, we, and you could say, hurrah, that's great. Uh, on the other hand, um, that can't go on forever. Yeah, and just, just coming in there, John, that's exactly why we emphasised in the paper the need for engagement with the public, because it needs to be a wider decision rather than a few politicians or a few experts even looking at this, because it's a decision we all need to take and we all need to agree on. So in the paper, having acknowledged that NHS funding at some point is going to have to 
sort of slow down in its rate of growth. You, you then do suggest that the uh, NHS is going to need another 32 billion over the next four years. Um, I wonder if you mind sharing how you came up with that figure, um, John, and then maybe Julian can come in and and mm -hmm. give us some insights as to how that money could be spent. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, maybe first of all to say, yes, it's approximately 32 billion. <laughs> I certainly avoided using a decimal point on that. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a broad estimate. Um, I mean, the basis for it is spending over the period from 2010 to about 2019, the average annual increase has, has been just over 1% real increase a year. Just over 1% just about covers changes in the population. The population of the UK has grown since 2010, um, it's generally older, uh, and so the demands on the NHS have grown. Um, so uh, we know emergency funding. The figure of 32 billion is essentially the gap between the actual spending from 2010 to 2019 and what it would have been if we'd carried on as a, a, a rate of historical rate of about 3.4%. And we're suggesting that we could catch up, if you like, on that on that gap over the next four or five years or so, um, if funding increased to something like a 4% real increase each year from, from next financial year, uh, you'd, you'd roughly cover that gap. Yeah, I mean, there's probably not much more for me to say, John, but I would definitely describe it as some sort of catch-up fund or a stabilisation fund, and as as well as the austerity that the COVID, the pandemic, really was a cataclysmic event in the history of our health service. There has never been anything that has disrupted healthcare in that way. Largely, you know, it's rolled forward year on year. And I used to describe it at NICE as being a bit like a tanker. Healthcare is like a tanker and it moves forward and it's very difficult to change it. And of course, the change was quite phenomenal. So many things were put on hold. Routine treatment didn't happen in many cases. We didn't detect cancers or heart disease early. So there is this need to catch up, to carry out routine orthopedic surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And Many staff were, were burnt out. They genuinely were by the end of the pandemic. So we've also seen an awful lot of staff turnover and staff leaving. So we do need some sort of catch up fund to help us get back into a status quo. Perhaps I could just finish by saying that I think the NHS is a fantastic success story. And I often look back to what it was funding in 1948. It was a completely different world. There were very few, very few effective treatments. We didn't do any joint replacements. We didn't do kidney dialysis. We didn't do coronary artery stenting. It, it, it was it was phenomenally different. And the success of the NHS is that it's adapted and grown and taken on, you know, targeted cancer treatments and you know, um, umpteen other new innovations that I saw at NICE over the last 20 years, and they will continue to come. So we do need to support the NHS, but we need, do need to help it see the way forward and help it prioritise what it funds and how it enables access to treatment for those that need it. And the article written by John Appleby and Gillian Leng, along with Martin Marshall, Professor of Healthcare Improvement at University College London, is called NHS Funding for a Secure Future and is available on bmj.com. That's it for this episode. We'll be back next time with an exclusive interview with Hilary Cass, who has chaired the Independent Review of Gender Identity Services for Children and Young People. The review's findings have already changed the use of puberty blockers in the NHS. Cass explains why they came to that decision and what needs to change so that gender diverse young people are supported by the NHS. Until then, I'm Cameron Abassi. Bye for now. <laughs>